Hey Cardinerds, this is Randerson Cardozo, Cardiology Fellow at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. It's my pleasure to talk to you today, and we're going to discuss atrial fibrillation. In the interest of time, I'll be very brief on the clinical presentation. Atrial fibrillation can present with more typical symptoms like palpitations, but also can present in many different ways. If the patient has ischemia, they can have angina, for example. If uh, they have a history of heart failure, or even if not, atrial fibrillation can precipitate heart failure. A lot of patients have nonspecific symptoms like fatigue and weakness. Presyncope can happen, but true syncope with atrial fibrillation is very rare unless the patient has another uh, reason of uh, why they have syncope, like aortic stenosis, for example. On exam, you want to check, obviously, the heart rate. Uh, in the inpatient setting specifically, you want to look for signs of end-organ perfusion, like how the patient looks, the blood pressure, urinary output, temperature to the touch, mental status, and you always look, want to look for signs of congestion as well. On the ECG, this is what a typical atrial fibrillation uh, uh, rhythm looks like. So the key here is that the rhythm is irregularly irregular. There's no pattern to the RR interval. And this is very important. There is no organized, consistent atrial activity. I want to emphasize that point because it's very common to see what may look like uh, atrial activity on the ECG, like over here. But I don't want you to be fooled by that. If that a blip that may look like a P wave is not consistent, doesn't repeat itself across the EKG, and it's an irregularly irregular rhythm, you found atrial fibrillation. What else? You want to look for signs of ischemia, specifically ST depressions, horizontal or downsloping, and obviously ST elevations as well. And you want to look at the heart rate on ECG. Not all atrial fibrillation has a rapid ventricular response, like this patient here has a slow ventricular response, and that may be because of uh, diseased AV nodes from uh, uh, conduction system disease in an er elderly patient, or it may be because you've poisoned the AV node with beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and so forth. Here are some important definitions in atrial fibrillation. You may have heard the term non-valvular AF, and that refers to atrial fibrillation in the absence of moderate to severe mitral stenosis or a mechanical heart valve. There's also definitions in terms of the duration of atrial fibrillation. If it terminates within seven days of onset, uh, either spontaneously or with a cardioversion, that's paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. If it lasts continuously more than seven days, that's persistent atrial fibrillation. And if it lasts continuously for more than 12 months, that's long-standing persistent. Permanent AF refers to a management strategy when the clinical team with the patient have decided that there will be no more attempts to restore or maintain sinus rhythm. In terms of the workup, I'll be brief here, but I want you to have in mind that you have to look for uh, quote-unquote reversible causes or uh, precipitating factors. I put this in quotes because AFib itself is not reversible. Once a patient has had atrial fibrillation, we, uh, we treat them as having that condition you know, lifelong in general. Now, uh, the factors that increase the burden of AFib, uh, they are reversible, and we want to take care of that to minimize the time that our patient is in atrial fibrillation and their symptoms and so forth. So those things are anemia, thyroid disease, leap apnea, alcohol or other drug use, uh, uncontrolled blood pressure, heart failure that's decompensated, so you want to address with uh, history and labs and work up all of those things and, of course, correct them with treatment. You want to get an echocardiogram to look for LV function, very important, but also other things like do they have valvular heart disease that's precipitating atrial fibrillation? Is there signs of heart failure with elevated filling pressures and so forth? We're going to talk about three things in the management of these patients, anticoagulation, rate control, and rhythm control. In terms of anticoagulation, you, all have, you may have heard of the chads vast score. Uh, in this score, uh, your, uh, each of these conditions listed on the left uh, is assigned a certain number of points. Um, and that total score, as you can see on the right-hand side, uh, relates to the uh, stroke uh, thromboembolic risk of the patient. And you can see here the risk of stroke on a, a, a percent per year base. So how do we anticoagulate these patients? What are our options? They include non-vitamin K antagonist oral anticoagulants, or NOACs. Uh, 
traditional warfarin or parenteral anticoagulation in select patients like bridging, for example, or in the hospital. So who needs anticoagulation? This is important. Patients who have valvular atrial fibrillation, they need to be anticoagulated and it has to be warfarin. So if a patient has a mechanical heart valve or moderate or severe mitral stenosis and they have atrial fibrillation, uh, you're going to anticoagulate them with warfarin. That's regardless of Chad's VASC, of course. And patients who have non-valvular AF, um, you're going to anticoagulate them if they have a Chad's VASC score of 2 or more in men or 3 or more in women. And there's a weaker recommendation for anticoagulation if it's one or more in men or two or more in women. Also, patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are going to anticoagulate regardless of Chad's VAS score. And in patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation, uh, and they have, assuming they have one of these conditions for anticoagulation, NOACs are preferred over warfarin in the latest American guidelines. This is an important slide, uh, refers to mitigating the risk of bleeding for patients on anticoagulation. So how do we do that? You always look for modifiable risk factors for bleeding, like uncontrolled hypertension, concomitant NSAID use or other medications, alcohol use, and so forth. And you want to avoid concomitant antiplatelet therapies. That greatly increases the risk of bleeding in these patients. So if someone was using aspirin for primary prevention and now they need no, uh, an anticoagulation for AFib, stop the aspirin. Even if they have stable atherosclerotic disease, like coronary artery disease, but they haven't had a recent stent or recent myocardial infarction, they should not be on antiplatelet therapy. Now, a patient with recent stenting uh, or acute coronary syndromes, you're going to need to involve cardiology there for that decision, but um, the key point here is to minimize triple therapy with aspirin, clopidogrel, uh, and anticoagulation. You want to have that uh, triple therapy for the minimum duration possible, and in most patients, you can actually avoid that altogether. But again, that's an individual decision. It depends on the type of stenting um, and, uh, that the patient had. Complex procedures, interventions may require triple therapy, so involve cardiology for that decision. Patients on anticoagulation and, and concomitant antiplatelet, they should be on a PPI. And don't forget that there's always an option to use percutaneous left atrial appendage occlusion for uh, stroke prevention in these patients if they have a long-term, uh, if they have a contraindication to long-term anticoagulation. So involve your cardi uh, the cardiologist or electrophysiologist in that decision as well. Moving on to rate control, who should be rate controlled? And that's everyone. And now we tend to think of rate control as a, um, uh, a mutually exclusive option with rhythm control, but that's not the case at all. Every patient who has atrial fibrillation uh, or has had it in the past and is now in sinus rhythm, you should think of ways that you would control their rate, even if they were to go into atrial fibrillation. So um, that's obviously more important in someone who uh, is always in atrial fibrillation or is frequently in atrial fibrillation because they have symptoms when they have very fast uh, ventricular rates. So you want to control that rate with beta blockers, non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. Um, you will remember to avoid those if they have heart failure, the calcium channel blockers. You can see the doses and medications on the right-hand side, both for IV use in the hospital and PO use for outpatient or inpatient. I just want to highlight something about the inpatient use or IV use, excuse me, of metoprolol. It's very short-acting. So uh, 5 milligrams of IV metoprolol is not a sustainable way to rate control a patient in the hospital. You may use it acutely, but you have to quickly think of either an IV drip or oral drugs to, uh, to control the rate. And miodarone may rarely be used for rate control uh, in patients who can't tolerate other rate controlling options. We use that sometimes in the hospital when the patients really can't tolerate a beta blocker or calcium channel blocker. But avoid that if you can because of that risk of cardioversion and thromboembolism. And then AV nodal ablation is a last resort when everything else has failed. Obviously, that requires a permanent pacemaker and you want to have cardiology uh, and EP involved in that decision. And we always try to avoid that um, as much as we can. The goal here is going to be less than 80 beats per minute of resting heart rate, but particularly if they're symptomatic or if they have any heart failure. Uh, in some cases where it's difficult to rate control and they have a normal LV function and asymptomatic, you can be a little bit more lenient. Moving on now to rhythm control, when do we decide to pursue rhythm control? Acutely, that's in the patient that has atrial fibrillation causing a hemodynamic instability. And I want to spend just a uh, minute here talking about this because it's really important. It's very rare that atrial fibrillation alone will cause a patient to go in, uh, become uh, unstable or have cardiogenic shock. It almost always happens when there's an associated condition. And then the trick is to decide 
which one is contributing more to the hemodynamic instability? Is it really atrial fibrillation or is it the other factor like sepsis, aortic stenosis, decompensated heart failure that they already had beforehand? So uh, that requires clinical judgment. I'll just give two quick examples. If you have a patient, for example, that has uh, sepsis and they're doing poorly related to sepsis and now they're in atrial fibrillation but their heart rate is about 110, 120, it's not the atrial fibrillation that's causing the shock. Be and that's important because it's not, you're not going to cardiovert that patient. Uh, and one, it's not going to help. Two, they're likely to go back into atrial fibrillation again because they're septic and so forth. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a patient, for example, that you're treating for decompensated heart failure and they have aortic stenosis, but they're doing okay, they're hemodynamically stable, and then they go into atrial fibrillation, and then they go into shock, you will cardiovert that patient urgently, emergently, to, um, to restore the hemodynamics. Aside from that emergent condition, you want to use rhythm control in patients who have symptoms despite adequate rate control, or patients who cannot be rate controlled because they can't tolerate the rate controlling agents due to side effects, uh, blood pressure issues, and so forth. Once you decide to restore sinus rhythm in someone, you're going to do it either with pharmacologic options uh, or electrocochal cardioversion, and that decision should involve cardiology as well. This is important for us to know. Uh, how are we going to anticoagulate patients at the time of cardioversion? And this applies to both electrical and pharmacologic. So the key thing is before cardioversion, we have to make sure that there is no left atrial appendage clot. How do we do that? There's three ways to do it. First, you anticoagulate them uninterruptedly for three weeks. That would be the ideal scenario. Uninterruptedly means they can't have missed even a single dose. Another way to do it is directly look at the left atrial appendage with a TEE, transesophageal echocardiogram. And then another way to do it is if the patient has clear onset of symptoms within 48 hours. But I put a marker there because the last guidelines say that the evidence for this approach is limited. And there's actually some evidence that suggests that the risk of thromboembolism starts going up after 12 hours that the patient's in atrial fibrillation and that it depends also on the CHADS VAS score. So uh, very few people, I think, would actually uh, cardiovert based on the latest guidelines, uh, this type of population. But it's something to keep in mind uh, that's also an option. Once you cardiovert the patient, everyone, actually even before cardioversion, after you've ruled out the left atrial appendage clot with one of those three approaches, everyone should be on anticoagulation at the time of cardioversion and stay on it for four weeks at least. After that, that those four weeks, you will anticoagulate based on the uh, chads vas score and other indications for anticoagulation that we discussed. And finally, uh, how are you going to maintain sinus rhythm in these patients that you've decided to rhythm control? You can use antiarrhythmic drugs um, like flecainide and others. Uh, I want to highlight the amiodarone is going to be a second or third line here. You want to avoid it because of the long-term toxicities. Uh, but this is a decision that you should make with cardiology and uh, electrophysiology. And catheter ablation is also an option for sinus rhythm. It has the same indications that we discussed for rhythm control. But uh, typically, we like to see that patients failed at least one antiarrhythmic drug before, but it's also an option to proceed straight to catheter ablation if the patient is unwilling uh, to try antiarrhythmic drugs. Now, there's also a class 2B recommendation for this in patients who have heart failure reduced EF, and there, in those patients, it may reduce mortality and hospitalizations in select patients based on two recent randomized trials. And again, that's another indication maybe to refer to cardiology or EP to have that discussion. So that brings us to our last slide of when to call cardiology. Um, some indications may be patients who you're having difficulty rate controlling. If you think rhythm control is a better strategy for one of the reasons we discussed. Uh, and if they have uh, paroxysmal or persistent atrial fibrillation and reduced EF, like we just talked about, uh, they may benefit from a uh, catheter ablation. And really, anytime you have a question, uh, reach out. We're happy to help. So that's what I wanted to share with you guys. It's a pleasure talking to you, um, and uh, see you soon, hopefully.